So welcome to Ask Your Givers, our July edition. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It's been a site of human activity for 15,000 years, and we want to uh, acknowledge that and remember that. Um, the land is the territory of the Huron Wenda and the two First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Carter River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Long Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across her land, and we're really grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and to share the joy of the on this land. Okay, so if this is your first Astro Group, welcome. If you're a regular uh, comer, welcome back. Uh, this happens every Thursday. Uh, Every month on the first Thursday of every month, uh, a couple of months, and it's a bit different, but you can always go to our website or our Facebook page and follow us on social media to get updated. Uh, this event is organized and run by graduate students in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, and we have additional help from volunteers, both graduate and undergraduate, in the Physics Department, the Astro Department, and sometimes the Aerospace Engineering Department. And this time we have a lot of our summer students who are helping us, so we're really grateful for them volunteering as well. Uh, so we also really value your feedback. So after the talk, you would like to give your feedback. You can go to this URL that I've written there. It'll also be up on the screen if you find it hard to read there. And we have some cookies as incentive for that. So if you can show that you filled out the feedback form, we can give you a cookie. I'll also know that. <laughs> okay, it works. <laughs> I also know that sometimes uh, afterwards when we go over to another building um, for the post-talk activities, the cookies will be relocated there after, so you'll have more opportunities. Okay, so yeah, after the talk, there are also planetarium shows, telescope observing, it's looking like a beautiful clear night, so I'm excited for that, um, virtual reality, and more. So definitely, if you have time, you should head over with us as we have to for that. I'll give more instructions on that afterwards. Um, I believe all our planetarium tickets have been taken, but there might be extras, and I'll tell you how you might be able to get some extras after the show. Okay, so without further ado, tonight's speaker is Anna O'Grady. She is a third year student, a third year PhD student in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. She's an expert on massive star evolution and exotic stars, and in her spare time, she enjoys participating in the departmental Dungeons and Dragons group. So please join me in welcoming Anna. Thank you very much, Martine. Um, I just want to check, uh, can people in the back hear me all right? Is the microphone volume okay? I see thumbs up. Okay. Okay, sure. I will just turn that up. So I'm really, really excited to be here to speak to everyone tonight. Um, so I'll be speaking to you about my experience traveling to Las Campanas Observatory in Chile and learning about what it means to be an observational astronomer. Uh, before I get to the trip, however, I'm going to give you a little bit of context as to why I was going there in the first place and what my thesis research is all about in terms of massive star evolution. So when we think of astronomy, one of the first things that might come to mind are stars that we see in the night sky, either those like our sun or those that we might see in the night sky like constellations. This is the constellation of Orion. If you've ever looked up into the night sky in the winter, even here in Toronto, you've definitely seen this constellation. It's very, very bright. And when you look up into the sky, you're seeing a large diversity of stars in terms of their sizes, big and small, their colors, their temperatures. And the types of stars that my research focus on is a particular type of star called massive evolved stars. So what does that mean? I can give you some examples. Within the constellation of Orion, there are two stars that are like this. The first is Betelgeuse, which is this very orange star in the top left part of the constellation of Orion. And the second is called Rigel, which is much blue in the bottom right. Uh, so these stars are known as supergiant stars. But what does that term mean? What does it mean for a star to be a supergiant compared to our own sun? 
I'm going to just walk you through some examples of stellar sizes. So in this diagram here, we have some examples of mostly stellar objects, although here in the bottom left we have Jupiter, the largest planet in our own solar system. So in terms of scale, that's our starting point. The next is a red dwarf star called Wolf 359, which is a very, very small star, but if you're a fan of the Star Trek series, you know the star quite well. Uh, the next uh, star here is our own sun, followed by Sirius A, the brightest star in our night sky. And all of these stars are what is known as, with the exception of Jupiter, dwarf or main sequence stars. And to be a main sequence star, um, a star must be um, in the longest part of its life, where it's burning hydrogen into helium in its core in a process called nuclear fusion. And this is how stars uh, produce the incredible amount of light and energy that you see them output. Um, but moving along here, what we're going to do here is we're going to take Sirius A and we're going to shrink it down. So this is the same star here, this little dot. So then you can see the stars next to it are quite a bit bigger. And these are stars known as giant stars. So this is the evolutionary track um, that is occupied by stars like our sun. So stars that are of similar mass to our sun, once they run out of hydrogen to burn in their core, they start having to burn the helium in order to keep themselves puffed up. And in the process of doing this, they end up swelling up to these giant sizes and becoming stars called red giants. And although these are fairly large stars and they're very cool, they're not precisely what I study. So moving on to the next one, we're again going to take the biggest star here and shrink them right down. And finally, here we'll see some familiar, familiar names. This is Rigel and Betelgeuse and also Antares, which is another uh, winter star. And these are what are known as supergiant stars. So the difference between a supergiant and a giant star is that um, you get supergiants when you start off with a main sequence star that is significantly more massive than our own sun. So a star that's still in the main sequence but uh, at a mass of seven or eight or 10 or even 20 or 30 times the mass of our sun. Once those types of stars run out of hydrogen, they take a different, different evolutionary track and swell up into supergiant stars. So if you compare our sun and go through this diagram here, stars like Betelgeuse have uh, a radius that is up to a thousand times greater than our own sun. So these stars are absolutely gigantic. And it is these supergiant stars um, that I study in my research. Um, so these are massive stars because they began as stars that are 10 to 30 times more massive than our sun. And they are specifically the ones that have evolved off the main sequence to become supergiants. So I'm going to give you a little bit more context in two particularly important areas of massive star evolution. The first is what happens to these stars when they die and what's left over when that happens. And the second is actually about binary evolution. So red supergiants like Betelgeuse, these are the types of stars that will explode as supernovae once they reach the end of their lives. So you begin with a massive main sequence star, so something that's bigger than our sun. It swells up into a supergiant once it stops burning hydrogen in its core, but eventually it will completely run out of fuel and it won't be able to produce the energy required to hold up its massive outer layer. The layers will collapse in towards the center, rebound, and the entire star will be blown apart in a supernova explosion. So, uh, and one important thing to note is that the more massive the star is, the faster this process happens. So if you take an eight solar mass star and a 30 solar mass star, the 30 solar mass star will run through its fuel at a significantly faster rate than the eight solar mass star and it will explode as a supernova quicker. And that'll be a little important later. So you have a supernova explosion, but then what happens after that? What are you left with? Or is the star just completely blown to smithereens? That's not the case. It depends on the mass of the star that you have. If you have an incredibly massive star, the remnant that's left over will be so massive that it will collapse under its own gravity and create an object called a black hole, which are incredibly interesting objects, but not the focus of my talk tonight. Instead, if you have a star that is still massive, but not so massive, 
you will instead create something called a neutron star. Now, neutron stars are really, really fascinating. They don't operate like traditional stars like our sun at all. Um, they're entirely made of the subatomic particle, the neutron, and they are incredibly dense. In terms of their size, the diameter of a neutron star is about the size of the city of Toronto, so big, but not so, so big when compared to other stars in the sky. But if you were to take a tablespoon of neutron star material, that tablespoon would weigh more than the entire Rocky Mountain chain. So these are incredibly, incredibly dense objects, and that gives them some unique properties. So this is one important part of uh, massive star evolution. But the other is actually binarity. So it turns out um, in a recent study um, f uh, five or six years ago that it was found that the vast majority of massive stars, so those that form supergiants and explode as supernovae, the vast, ma vast, vast majority uh, exist in binary systems. Binary systems like this one. So a binary star system is when you have two stars that are orbiting a common center of mass. And um, because you have two stars in the system, uh, a number of different interactions can take place over the life of the binary that are incredibly interesting and valuable in an astrophysics context. You've probably, over the past two years, actually heard a lot about one particular type of binary interaction, and that's colliding neutron stars. So if you have the situation where you have two massive stars that both explode as supernovae and create two neutron stars, if those neutron stars eventually merge, you will create the type of event that we saw as the gravitational wave event two years ago uh, with LIGO. And while that's a very, very interesting uh, avenue for binary evolution, it's not the only way a binary system can evolve. And the type of star that I study is uh, an interesting avenue. So what happens if instead of having two remnants, neutron star plus neutron star, you have the situation where in your binary, one star is much more massive and explodes as a supernova before the other star is able to also explode. So in the situation where you have a neutron star and another supergiant star, what happens if those two objects were to merge? What, what would that even look like? Can those types of stars even exist? Um, this is a question that was posed and theorized actually in the 1970s, and the result is quite an interesting type of star. So I'll tell you a little bit about them, beginning with their formation. So how do you make a neutron star merge with a supergiant? There are two possible avenues. The first is a path called common envelope evolution. So you have a binary that's spinning around, uh, but eventually the more massive component will explode as a supernova and leave behind a neutron star. Then once this happens, time flows onward, the binary continues to orbit. However, the other main sequence star in this binary will eventually reach the point where it will swell up into a red supergiant. And if the binary is close enough, the orbit of the neutron star will actually be disrupted. It will fall into the envelope of the red supergiant and it will eventually coast in towards the center and merge with the center of the supergiant. So that's method number one, how you get a neutron star into another star. The second method, in my opinion, is way cooler. So if you have the situation where the uh, stars are a little closer in mass, so when the first star explodes, the second is already a supergiant, uh, then if you consider a supernova explosion for a moment, they're incredibly energetic, and there's also no reason to assume that the supernova explosion will be perfectly symmetric, that the energy on all sides of this sphere of explosion will be exactly the same. There could be more energy on one side or the other, it could be asymmetric, and if that happens, you could impart a little bit of a kick to the neutron star. So if this happens and you're pointing in just the right direction, you can take the neutron star and fire it directly into the other red supergiant which is awesome. <laughs> it's very, very dramatic in terms of astronomical things. So here are the two ways that you can create this situation, where you have a neutron star uh, inside the envelope of a red supergiant. It's essentially a stellar turducken in that sense, because it's two very distinct objects, two stars that are stuck inside of each other. 
And the name for this object is a Thorn Zitkov object. I'll mostly be abbreviating that as a TZO, but the reason that it's called that is that in 1975, Kip Thorne and Anna Zikov, two astronomers, um, hypothesized the question, can you have a neutron star merge with a supergiant and will it stay stable? Will it still be able to fuse? Will it still operate as a normal star? And they worked out the physics and they worked out the math and it turns out that the answer was actually yes. In terms of our understanding of the laws of physics in our universe, these stars can exist if they form. However, in 1975, there, weren't, there wasn't exactly the opportunity to try and observe these stars. So all they had was their physical theoretical basis. And this is just a quote from their paper that I thought was very relevant. Undoubtedly, the strongest reason to believe that stars with neutron cores exist in nature is the universal law that everything not forbidden is compulsory. By comparison, any other basis for discussing their existence is extremely uncertain. Nevertheless, it is fun to speculate. And of course, speculation is where all of science begins. But if we want to take these incredibly exotic objects out of the realm of speculation and into our reality, we would need to find examples of them. So how precisely would you do that? Well, we know that these should look on the outside like red supergiants. Um, but if you just look up in the night sky at all of the red and luminous stars, how would you be able to tell the difference between a TZO and your run-of-the-mill normal red supergiant? Is there anything that creates a distinctive difference between these objects that we can actually observe on Earth without, without having to travel the cosmos to visit any of these stars? And it turns out that there is. So this is a simple schematic of the interior of a TZO. You have the neutron star at the core, surrounded by the red supergiant envelope. And in between those is the atmosphere of the neutron star. And this atmosphere is incredibly hot. It's like hotter than Toronto has been the last few days. That's how hot it is. Um, so, and it is so hot, in fact, that a special type of nuclear synthesis can happen inside of a Soren Zikov object that doesn't happen inside of a red supergiant. Again, where nuclear fusion is where stars are able to produce energy to keep their outer envelope up. And this type of nuclear fusion allows for extremely heavy elements, things like rubidium and molybdenum, to be synthesized in the atmosphere of a Thorn Zikov object. And you would never see those particular elements in a red supergiant. So that right there is the ticket. If we can somehow uh, look at the elemental composition of stars in our galaxy and look for these elements, that's how we're going to be able to tell the difference. But then, how do you do that? How do you look at a star in the sky and figure out what elements it's made out of? Well, we do that um, through a process called looking at the spectrum of a star. So what the spectrum is, is essentially you can take light and split it up into its many colors. So that's represented by this color bar at the top here. And this graph is showing the intensity of all of these various colors. And every single element on the periodic table has essentially a spectral fingerprint. It has a special set of lines, like these lines here, that will, it will cause these dips in the spectrum of a star. And every single element has a unique signature of these lines. So by using um, a tool called a spectrogram, we can look at the light coming from stars, split it up into its many colors, and search for the fingerprints of these TZO elements. So this is exactly how you, how you would find a thorn object. And this is how, in 2014, the first and to date only candidate thorn object was actually discovered. It's in the Small Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy of our own Milky Way. And it was uh, identified by Emily Levesque and her collaborators, which included, I was really happy to see this, Anna Zikov is on this paper. So she was part of the theorizing and also the possible discovery of this object. Uh, so this uh, Thorn Zikov candidate that has the possible spectral features, it's actually somewhere in the star field. Does anyone want to try and guess which of these stars is the exotic TZO? It's that one right there, this guy. 
So kind of mundane when you look at it in this sense, but in terms of its spectra, it looks very, very interesting. However, like many things in science, its nature is a little uncertain. While the Levesque paper posits that it is a TZO, there's a, another paper that came out recently that thinks that the spectral characteristics are more similar to a weird type of giant star, but not a thorn cov object. So in order to try and work out its nature, it would be really great if we could find more of these objects. And then that's where my project began. Um, as I started uh, the uh, official part of my PhD, I began working on this project and um, so we wanted to find more of these objects, but you can't just go and take all of the red stars in a particular patch of sky and take spectra of it. That would take far too long. Spectroscopy is a really time consuming process. So what you want is a targeted list of stars that you think are good candidates to go and get spectra of. So the Levesque team, they found the reddest stars in the Magellanic Clouds because these are those are expected to be extraordinarily red, red supergiants. We took a little bit of a different approach. It turns out that this candidate, in addition to its interesting spectral features, is also an extremely variable star. And when I say variable, I mean that the intrinsic brightness of the star changes over time. So it gets brighter and dimmer, sort of like these lights. It gets very dim and then very bright over time. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so it gets bright and dim and bright and dim, and it does this over a period of two years. And the amount that it's changing in its brightness is so dramatic, it's actually completely abnormal for regular red supergiants to be varying by this much. So we thought, okay, here's our hypothesis. If we assume that the Levesque paper is correct and this is a Thorn-Zikov object, then perhaps its strange variability is coming from the fact that it isn't a normal red supergiant. It has a neutron star stuck inside of itself. Maybe that would cause some strange variability. So for my project, I searched in the Magellanic Clouds to try and find other stars that had the same variability properties as this candidate, and I was successful. I found nine more of them, which is great. Uh, but you know, we have their variability properties, but the thing that's really important is getting the spectra. And then this is where a trip to an observatory is necessary, because you need to go to a place that has a very good telescope with a very good spectrograph in order to take this data. So now I'm going to be telling you what that is really like. So you might have a picture in your head as to what it looks like when an astronomer goes to an observatory. I Googled astronomer observatory cartoon in Google, and this is the first thing that came up. <laughs> so it was just the first thing, so I just grabbed it. So <laughs> there's a couple things that are a little wrong with this image. First of all, judging by the size of the planets outside, he appears to be in space. We don't, we don't do that. Also, that meteor is way too close for comfort. That's huge. I would not be so dedicated to continue observing if there was that big of a meteor right outside my dome. Also, there's no reason to be wearing a lab coat. Most obser observations are much more casual. But also, while this might be the way that astronomical observations were done you know, half a century ago, modern astronomy, it isn't like this. There are a few things that are quite different First of all being that you are almost never alone. Often you travel with collaborators, which I did, but especially you're almost always working with a telescope operator because the telescopes aren't the size anymore. You can't move them around with your own two hands. They're extremely large and they're also extremely expensive. And no one in their right mind would let an astronomer with no engineering background physically move the telescope around. So you work in a partnership with the telescope operators that work at these observatories. So now um, I'm gonna be telling you about, um, I went to Las Campanas Observatory two times in March and December of 2018. The pictures I'll be showing you are from both, but the stories are more so from the December trip because that one got way more interesting. So, just to begin, uh, this is myself, and on the left, this is Dr. Maria Drought. She is one of my thesis supervisors. On the right is Bethany Ludwig, who is another uh, PhD student who also works with Maria, and she took some of the pictures that I'll be showing as well. And this is us at Las Campanas Observatory. But beginning in terms of the travel, where is this place, and how do you get there? So Las Campanas Observatory is in Chile, down in South America, so you need to travel quite a ways to get to it. 
Um, so for most people uh, at the university, that involves traveling from Toronto. For myself in December, I was actually traveling a little farther. I was in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, which is where I'm from. Um, I was visiting my family for the holidays. So how do you get there? Because like, I wouldn't be so lucky that there would just be a direct flight. I could hop on a plane to St. John's, get off, walk directly into the telescope. No, unfortunately not. So starting off, I left St. John's saying goodbye to my family and my lovely cat. Her name is Jupiter. <laughs> Fly to Toronto. Oh, I apologize. This is being a little funky. Okay. Fly to Toronto and then you make the 10 and a half hour flight from Toronto down to Santiago, which is the largest city in Chile. Then we actually need to turn around and go north and fly to a place called La Serena. So all in all, this is about uh, 15 hours on an airplane, not counting the layovers. So it takes a little while. But then you arrive in La Serena and it looks very, very beautiful there. Uh, however, this is the ocean and you know we don't want our observatories near the ocean. Our observatories, we have them high up on mountains for several reasons. We want to get away from low-laying low clouds, any precipitation. We don't want to be near humid areas like the ocean because it can affect the optics of the telescope. And most importantly, we want to get above as much of the atmospheric turbulence as we possibly can. So we go from La Serena all the way up to Las Campanas. So we all pile into a minivan <laughs> and then we make our way up the mountain, 2.4 kilometers up in total. Um, there isn't too much to the atmospheric difference. I never noticed very much with the exception, if you're running up and down a lot of stairs at the observatory, then you notice very quickly that the air is thinner up there. So this is a bird's eye view of Las Campanas Observatory on top of a giant mountain in Chile. And I'll walk you through some of the areas in more detail. This down here is where the main lodge and all the bungalows where the astronomers and operators sleep during the day. Over here is um, a part of the mountain that has uh, several telescopes. I'll tell you a little bit about them. But these two dots up here are the Magellan telescopes. And these are the telescopes that I and uh, my colleagues did our observations on. Uh, so here are some of the views from the top of the mountain. I am actually just going to do that. Helps a little bit. Um, so it is everything, there is a very dark beauty to everything up there. Uh, the mountains are huge. You're looking down into these gigantic valleys. The sun is extraordinarily strong. You have to be really careful and make sure that you're wearing sunblock at all times. Um, and the, area, the areas around the observatory are just absolutely stunning. This is the main lodge. So this is where you're mostly going to be hanging out if you're not up at the telescope. So you wake up in the morning, you have your breakfast, which for people who are not on the night shift is actually lunch. Uh, you go up to the telescope in the afternoon to do some initial calibrations, come back down for dinner, and then go back, back up at twilight. This is what it looks like inside the lodge. Um, it's really nice in there. And also the chefs that work at Las Campanas do an absolutely amazing job. It's some really great food while I was there. Um, you'll also notice all of the blinds are closed. When astronomers go on the night shift for observing, we tend to act a little bit like vampires. We really don't like looking directly into the sun. So in the afternoon, when the sun is shining directly through the windows, we close the blinds so that people don't get grumpy. Um, and the room is empty here, but you'll notice there's a lot of tables and during dinner and lunchtime, those are almost all completely full. So there are five major telescopes on top of the mountain that um, when they're running require an observer and an, a telescope observer and a observing astronomer in order to function. So you get to meet lots of really interesting people because there's going to be other astronomers up there working on incredibly diverse projects. So you get to meet um, a lot of people. You can make some new human friends. You can also make some animal friends as well. This is called a viscacha. They're like this big or so. And they're this really, they're native to Chile and they're this really interesting combination of a rabbit and a kangaroo because when they move, they hop like kangaroos. Um, they're very, very cute and they kind of congregate in the evenings around the base of the telescope. So you can kind of sneak over and get a look at them and they're very adorable. Um, there's also, I didn't personally witness this, but 
This is something called a sky camera, where it allows astronomers inside the telescope domes to look outside and see the weather. And apparently there's this owl that loves sitting on top of the sky camera and just saying hello to all of the visiting astronomers. This has happened multiple times, apparently. So uh, there is actually, in addition to many humans, there are many animals on top of the observatory as well. So this is looking from the lodge out towards the telescopes. I'm gonna take us over here now to some of the smaller telescopes. On the left here, uh, this is the DuPont telescope. It's a 2.5 meter uh, telescope. This here is called the Ogle telescope. It is a gravitational lensing experiment that's run from Poland, which is very interesting. And this here is the Henrietta Swope telescope. It's a one meter telescope, uh, but very, uh, very interestingly, this is the telescope where the very first light from that neutron star neutron star merger that happened two years ago was seen. The first team that identified the transient for that merger uh, identified it with this telescope, which is very cool. Uh, you'll see that everything is bathed in a very pretty sunset light. Uh, this is what most sunsets look like on top of the mountain. Um, it's very clear, there's a really nice gradient um, going from blue to red. And um, has anyone here ever heard of the green flash that can happen? So this is actually real. Um, I think it's easier to see if you're at a higher altitude. Um, except for me, I was expecting um, when the sun set for there to be sort of like a green glow that happened around the sun or something very ethereal. But what happened was just as the sun was dipping below the horizon, the actual disk of the sun just straight up turned green. It turned from a yellow to like a vivid green color and it was really, really freaky and amazing. So that was a neat experience. But moving back um, to the science objectives of our trip, these are the two Magellan telescopes. So these are the current crown jewels of Las Campanas Observatory. Um, there are two of them. They're functionally identical. There's a little bit of instrumentation difference between them, but they are both eight and a half meter telescopes. They're very large. Uh, this is uh, standing on the catwalk of one, so my back is to one of the telescopes here. This is the dome of the other one. I'm going to get you to remember this little squat building right here. Just keep that in the back of your mind, because that's going to come back in a bit of a dramatic fashion later in the talk. Um, but this is, so this is what the telescope domes look like. Um, so you come up here um, in the evening around twilight to do some initial calibrations and to watch the sunset. Um, and then if you're a new person to the observatory like me, the telescope operators will actually take the telescope and instead of pointing it up like it normally faces, turn it down so that you can look into the dish. So this is the primary mirror of the Magellan Telescope. So this is eight and a half meters across. Um, it's very large. I remember looking at a picture similar to this before I went and then when I saw it in person, I'm like, oh, that's much bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, so these are absolutely massive pieces of equipment and they're very, very impressive. Uh, but this right here, this is the operating room. Uh, this is where you sit for the vast majority of the night. You're not inside the dome with the telescope because it is a gigantic piece of machinery and it would be incredibly dangerous to be around it while it's moving around. So the observing astronomer sits on the um, left-hand side of the desk here with a fair amount of screens. The telescope operator gets three times the number of screens over on the right hand side. And this is where you spend the majority, the vast majority of the night. You are either uh, setting up to take an observation or most often you are waiting for an observation to finish. A lot of the time you are, um, I'm sorry, can anyone hear a buzzing sound? Yes. Yeah, hang on. I think it might be, yeah, that was on, okay. Um, so the vast majority of the time, uh, especially if you're doing something, like if you're taking spectroscopy of a really dim star, like what we were doing, uh, you can be sitting on that and collecting light for an hour or two hours. So you have a lot of downtime. Um, there is a snack room in the bottom of the telescope, which has a lot, like the LCO staff clearly understand that astronomers will get the munchies while we are observing. Um, so you can do that. I know for a fact that a lot of astronomical papers are written in rooms like these because when you're just waiting for your data to come in, may as well do some other bits of work. 
Um, this is what some of our screens that we're using look like. So on the left here, this is um, the output for the telescope. So right here is what the telescope is actually looking at. It's looking at a neat star cluster here. This giant blob up here is the guide star. So the camera tracks onto a bright star nearby your target to make sure that it's tracking properly. This is the error message. So if something goes wrong with the telescope, you'll get a little message here. On the right here, we actually have photometry output from one of the observations that we were doing. And you can see here, there's a really beautiful pair of galaxies. And this was actually something that my supervisor, Dr. Drought, she was looking at these galaxies to find a new supernova that had recently gone off. So you get to see lots of really interesting things. Um, so I mentioned the, uh, so when you're here, uh, the day-to-day -day night, you follow something that is called an observing schedule. It looks something like this. It's a little complicated, but essentially you map out every single target that you want to look at, where it is in the sky, so you can tell the telescope operator where to move the camera, what instrument you want to use, and how long you're gonna look at the observing night. And on the average night, you follow this like a checklist, and everything goes very smoothly, one by one by one. Um, this is what it looks like actually sitting at the operating uh, station here. This box here is where I control most of the telescope things. Um, so on a typical night, things go very smoothly, but not all nights are typical nights. The very first night that we were there in December, um, everything went totally fine, except the coffee machine in the break room was broken. And I forget who made this joke, but somebody joked, wouldn't it be funny if the only thing that went wrong during our whole four night observing run was that the coffee machine was broken? And thus saying this, we angered the telescope gods with our hubris, because then every single night after that, something interesting happened. So one of the nights, instead of having the very nice sunset like before, the sky looked more like this. Photographer Anna is just delighted. This is a beautiful sunset. I don't get to see sunsets like this in Toronto quite as much. Astronomer Anna is very sad because you can't see through these clouds to take observations. So this is when your observing uh, schedule changes from a checklist to a Tetris board because you need to start figuring out, okay, I went from having seven hours to having five or maybe only three usable hours during the night. You need to decide what objects are actually priority. Out of your 15 or 20 objects you're going to observe during the night, you're only gonna get five. So which five is it gonna be? So sometimes you really have to think on the fly and decide what science needs to be prioritized. So sometimes mother nature gets in the way. However, sometimes things happen with the telescope. Um, this is actually the readout from the spectrograph on the telescope. So this is the object that we use to get the spectra of the stars. And when we were using this uh, one night, uh, there was an error that popped up on the screen. So for objects like these, you have filters or prisms that can go in front of the instrument that give you different types of data. And they're all in this wheel that rotates and locks into place when you choose which prism that you would like. So we were switching to a new prism and we click on the button and then we get a dunk dunk error. And on the screen it says filter wheel error, clamp failed. And then this is where the absolute necessity of a telescope operator comes in because my expertise is in physics and math. I don't know what clamp failed means. I wouldn't even know where to begin to look on this gigantic monster of a machine. Um, I told Jorge, who was our telescope operator that, that night, he was like, okay, he gets up, he goes in the telescope dome. 15 minutes later, he comes back out, you're good to go. And that is where the expertise of the telescope operators really shines. So you can have minor bumps in the road like that, but sometimes you hit larger bumps. Um, the second night that we were there, everything was going totally fine. Our telescope operator turns to us and says, you need to stop the observation, something seems to be wrong. We're like, okay. So we stop what we're doing. And then he says to us, and I promise you, this is exactly what he said word for word. The telescope dropped. <laughs> we need to go to the church. <laughs> Okay, okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> what, what do you, is the telescope okay? Do we need to pray for the telescope? <laughs> what, what do you mean it dropped? Did it fall down? What happened? So thankfully the, the operators did not keep us in suspense. Here's what happened. So this is a picture of the telescope with a me for scale, so you can see how big this thing is. And there's this groove that's running along the ground here. 
Um, and all of the telescope sits inside of the circle. And essentially, the telescope needs to be able to move around to look at different things in the night sky. And you want it to move as smoothly as possible so that you don't jitter any of the instruments on the telescope around. So the entire telescope sits on a bed of pressurized oil that lets it slide around easily. Um, and that bed of oil is about a centimeter high when it is pressurized. And it's kept at that pressure by one of three compressor systems that are in this building. This is the church. <laughs> Named so because of the way the roof is shaped, but also because it holds three very sacred artifacts for the operation of the telescope. So essentially what had happened was one of the compressors had a short circuit and took down all three. So all of the redundancies failed, the oil depressurized, and the telescope sank into its little crevice by about a centimeter. So it's a lot less terrifying than my initial thought when he told us that the telescope had dropped. Um, but still, it's a problem. Uh, when this happened, I think at one point we had uh, every single telescope operator who was on the mountain inside of our room trying to fix this problem. So there was like 12 people inside the room at one point. But they got it fixed, and then we were able to continue with our observations. And this is why, in terms of modern astronomy and being able to take data on such massive and complex machines as this, telescope operators are absolutely essential to the scientific process. They are experts in the operation of the telescope. They are the ones who help you when something breaks with the telescope, and we wouldn't be able to do our science without their expertise. So I gave you some examples of what happens on very dramatic nights during a telescope observation, but sometimes nights go very, very smoothly and you have some free time. And you might write papers, you might make plots, you might do some other uh, scientific data, but you might also take a little bit of time and go outside. And so now for the very last part of the talk, I'm going to be showing you some of the pictures of the night sky in Chile. So for this, I am gonna turn the lights down, but I will turn them back up as soon as we are done with the talk. So this is what the night sky looks like outside, directly outside the telescope. So while I hear it's going to be a very beautiful and clear night here in Toronto, uh, there are a couple differences with what you're going to see here. It's significantly, significantly darker, and you're also looking at the southern hemisphere sky. So you have constellations like, sorry about that, the Southern Cross, which is this object up here. This is kind of like uh, Polaris and the Little Dipper for us in the northern hemisphere. And then they're a little tricky to see here, but you can see these two smudges, it almost looks like, in the sky. There's a little one right here, and there's a big one right there. Those are the small and large Magellanic clouds. So when you're looking at them, you are looking at dwarf galaxies that exist outside the Milky Way. And these are the objects that we were actually looking at and observing. Uh, this picture is a little less, ex less exposed, but it is the best approximation that I could get with my camera to what I was actually seeing with my own eyes once I got used to the darkness outside. So you can see thousands, literally thousands of stars in the sky. The arm of the Milky Way is as bright as day. You can see it super obviously down there. But the most unique thing that I found was that there was almost a depth to the sky that I feel like I didn't get here in Toronto or even in darker St. John's. Um, I could really tell that I was looking out into like a three-dimensional object and it felt like there was a depth in the sky, which was absolutely incredible. Um, this is looking back the other way, so towards the Magellan Telescope, but then there's a familiar figure in the sky. We have the constellation of Orion again, except he's upside down. Um, and he's turned over because for constellations that you can see from both hemispheres, when you're looking at them, you are looking at them from completely opposite points of view, depending on where you are. And just to finish off with my photographs here, here we're looking back at the two Magellan telescopes and this really bright patch here, this is actually looking into the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So you're looking towards the many hundreds of star clusters, the supermassive black hole is in there somewhere. So when you look at that, you are looking into the heart of our galaxy. Um, 
So just to finish off here, I'm actually going to be leaving you with some more professional astrophotography. Um, the next images that I'm going to end off on were taken by Yuri Beletsky. He's an astronomer who works at Las Campanas Observatory, and he very, very graciously loaned me one of his tripods. So uh, it was because of his generosity that I was able to take even any of these photographs. But in addition to that, he is an absolutely incredible astrophotographer. I have his information here, his Instagram and his Twitter. Go check him out. He is absolutely amazing. And I really love these types of photographs because I think that they show the blending of science and art that a lot of astronomy embodies in its work. Um, and I love that it shows the vastness of our universe and the types of interesting stars and mysteries that I get to explore um, as a PhD student. And it makes me so incredibly thankful to have the opportunity to travel to places like this and learn what it's like to be an observing astronomer at places like Las Campanas. And I will leave us again with the two Magellan telescopes. And thank you very much for coming along with me on this journey. I hope you enjoyed this and I will be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can take people, so yeah, I'll actually do that. So green shirt way in the back. Awesome, so that was a great question. So the question was, I mentioned earlier in the talk that I found nine objects that had similar variability properties to the really good TZO candidate. Um, have we been able to look at them with their spectra and um, have they seemed weird? So we do have spectra of about half of those candidates at the moment that we got in our December trip. Um, we haven't analyzed them yet because at the moment I'm actually wrapping up the paper talking about the variability properties of these objects. But in addition, we want to have a complete sample to analyze. And I mentioned before that the variability of these objects, um, it goes from peak to peak over 600 days. So unfortunately, a bunch of the candidates were at the lowest part of their variability. So they were so incredibly dim, we weren't able to get spectra of them. And if it takes 600 days to go from peak to peak, if something's in the, in the dimmest part of its light curve, you need to wait a year for it to come back up. So we will be returning to Las Campanas this fall to get the rest of the spectroscopy then. And if I find something really incredible, maybe I will be giving another Asher tourist talk in the new year. <laughs> uh, yep. Why did the red giants swell in the first place? Mm -hmm. Basically without pressure, but mm -hmm. what changes? So the question was why do red giants swell up in the first place? So um, once stars, uh, Excuse me. Once stars run out of hydrogen to burn in their core, they need to start burning the helium that they were producing in that nuclear fusion. And helium has a higher burning point than hydrogen. It's less energy efficient to burn than hydrogen, which is why hydrogen is always the first thing that a star will burn. So by doing this, um, it essentially creates um, it's less energy efficient, but it creates a little bit more explosive energy, and the star swells out because of that. Any other questions? Yep. So my question is more about how the operator is moving the, uh, the lens for you. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to go from one position to another position? Mm -hmm. And what are you doing during that time? That's an excellent question. So the question was, in terms of the actual physical movement of the telescope, how long does it take to move from one point to another point? And then what am I doing during that? So it depends on where you're moving. So a lot of the time we were looking at objects that were in the Magellanic Cloud. So if you remember, I had the two circles up, they're all in a really tight area of the sky. So moving between those candidates would take 15 to 20 seconds maybe. However, if you're changing targets to something completely, like if you're moving on to a new science goal, you might slew completely across the sky. In that sense, it can take, um, 
I think the longest we ever waited was about five minutes for it to go completely, because the telescope, it moves relatively smoothly, but it can't move super, super quickly. And then in terms of what we're doing, this is the point where we're using that interface on the computer and changing anything that needs to be changed for the observation. So we're making sure that the right filter is in front of our instrument and making sure that the clamp isn't broken on the instrument. Uh, we're changing the exposure time because some stars you collect light for 60 seconds and some of them you need to collect light for two hours. So we set up the uh, sort of technical details of the observation while the telescope operator is controlling the physical movement of the telescope. Yep. That's a great question. So the question was, um, what does the theory say about what uh, Thorin-Zhikov objects end up once they reach their lifetimes? So essentially, you have the neutron star inside of the red supergiant envelope, and it is actually slowly accreting material. So it's pulling material from the envelope onto itself. This is actually where all the nuclear fusion is happening. Um, so a few different things can happen, and it depends on how big the neutron star already is and how much mass the supergiant portion of the star is losing. Because a lot of very, very massive luminous stars actually are blowing off some of their material. Um, it's essentially due to being so bright, they overcome radiation pressure in their atmospheres. Um, so if you have the situation where the mass loss in the red supergiant is extremely fast, you will blow off the envelope until you are just left with a neutron star with an accretion disk around it. And then that neutron star just goes about its day. If the, um, if the mass loss rate is slow and the accretion rate is higher, then you will eventually get to the point where the neutron star accretes too much mass and it will collapse in on itself and form a black hole. So there is a situation where you can have it collapsing in and creating a black, a black hole that would then absorb the rest of the material. Okay, great. I think okay. Yeah. If anyone has any more questions, you can come down after. Yeah.